Okay, good morning to, to everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Luciano Saso. I'm the president of UNICA. I would like to welcome all of you to this uh, UNICA student webinar on pharma and biotech uh, careers in Europe, uh, organized in uh, cooperation with European Pharmaceutical Students Association. And, uh, you know, we are very happy to organize these activities in, uh, in UNICA. Uh, for students because uh, we feel that employability is really very important, is a key uh, mission for, for universities to make sure that our students, they know uh, exactly what uh, you know, they can expect after they will graduate. And indeed, uh, in this sectors, pharma and biotech uh, is not very clear, I think, for, for students to know exactly which are the opportunities. So we decided to launch a series of webinars. This is the second one. Already there will be another one uh, planned uh, in January, so uh, keep an eye on the UNICA website to know, you know more about uh, the, the next one, to try to cover different functions, different positions, different careers. And I really want to thank very much uh, all uh, the colleagues uh, who accepted to uh, you know, speak uh, at this uh, webinar. We will introduce them uh, you know, later uh, during the, the webinar. Uh, but we, today uh, we will cover some important functions like uh, the activities of the clinical research organizations, uh, the clinical research quality management, uh, marketing and uh, medical affairs, uh, regulatory affairs. And also we will have a presentation by uh, Science Park, you know, showing what is a science park, uh, which are the opportunities there. And this is also things very often neglected by students who do not think of opportunities uh, there. Uh, I also want to thank my colleague and friend, uh, Jos Thomas, uh, guest lecturer of uh, KU Leuven and uh, senior consultant at Pharmacy S, who um, we've been working together for this uh, series, uh, you know, quite a lot in the last uh, few months. And, uh, you know, we are very excited to, to continue with these activities. I want to thank very much uh, Sibel Susan, um, also a colleague from the Faculty of Pharmacy of Ankara University and also a member of the steering committee uh, of UNICA. So uh, UNICA, again, uh, I, I really invite all participants to uh, look at our website. We organize many other activities, not only related to employability, but also related, for instance, to education, to the innovative pedagogies, to digitalization. In this uh, tragic period of uh, uh, COVID, uh, we learned that you know, we could do more things online. And UNICA is reacting quite well uh, uh, to all that. So again, I invite all participants to look at our website. Uh, which uh, reports activities at the moment from 53 universities in 37 capital cities. So I'm very proud to be president of this uh, very strong uh, association. And, uh, you know, we try our best again to share good practices, uh, uh, you know, among uh, uh, different members. So now without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Mihai Yonita, uh, the president of the European Pharmaceutical Student Association. Thank you very much for, for the introduction and for passing the floor. Uh, like Luciano said, my name is Mihai Anitza. I am the president of European Pharmaceutical Students Association, an association that was founded in 1978. We have a long tradition and today we're representing uh, 42 member associations from 37 countries. And through that, we are representing over 100,000 pharmaceutical students. Our mission is to bring um, pharmacy knowledge and students together while promoting professional development. And in order to achieve that, we have a lot of projects, a lot of activities. From, um, the most important ones would be the events. Through our events, uh, we are managing together more than 1,000 European pharmaceutical students every year. Uh, we have three events, one happening in April, one happening in the summer, usually in July, and one in the autumn. Unfortunately, this is the area where we are hit, let's say, the strongest by the pandemic, but we are trying to adapt, and we've had our online event in the, um, in the autumn. Uh, besides those, we have a lot of smaller projects that are also... Um, uh, working hand in hand with the events, but not only, we are also tackling online. Uh, we are working towards continuous education of students. We are working towards achieving, uh, educating the population through public health campaigns and social services. We are all teaching students into the world of soft skills uh, through our EPSA trainings. 
Uh, we are also touching science through a publication we call EPSA Student Science Publication. We are promoting, we are publishing their um, abstracts of scientific papers. We have a science day where we are presenting the, um, the papers that students are researching and so on. If you'd like to know more about our projects, I will warmly invite you to search for us on social media or to go to our website where we are posting everything. If you keep an eye on it, as students, you could be you could be in touch with what is happening and you could take part in all of this. We are also very active in advocacy. We are... Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. And now it is a pleasure to give the floor to uh, Sibel Susan, a professor at the Faculty of Pharmacy at Ankara University in Turkey and member of the Steering Committee of UNICAF. Thank you, Professor Sasso. Uh, this is another very important meeting uh, we are together. Although this is not a very formal meeting, uh, I think it is much more important to reach the students and uh, next generation of uh, pharmacists, basically, or related to pharmacy people. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank all the uh, speakers, today's speakers. They will be sharing very important um, stuff with us and also uh, maybe at the end we can add some remarks uh, to their talks uh, including how to uh, prepare themselves after their graduation uh, how to find uh, their way into this kind of uh, research areas or biotechnological areas so um, uh, thank you again, uh, Professor Sasso, for organizing this important uh, meeting for uh, the next professional students. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Susan, for your kind words. And now it's a pleasure to give the floor uh, to Professor Jos Thomas, a guest lecturer at KU Leuven in Belgium and a senior consultant of the pharmacy. Yes. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm not going to take too much of your time. Um, uh, I've been contributing to uh, the, um, the fact that uh, a number of students are not totally aware of what's going on outside community pharmacies and hospital pharmacies for many years. So I'm very pleased also to be able to contribute to this one a bit behind the scene, but um, with the same enthusiasm as always. Back to Luciano for the first speaker, please. Thank you very much, uh, Joss. And uh, Joss really played a very important role in designing these webinars, in contacting the speakers, etc. So really, thank you very much. You know, without uh, you, Joss, all this would have not be possible. Uh, and so now, without further ado, we start with the presentations. Uh, let me remind you that uh, this webinar will be recorded, so you can also tell your friends and colleagues to go back to the Unica website and find the recording of this. Also, you will find the slides of the speakers uh, there. And uh, we also ask all participants to ask uh, uh, questions in the chat because the discussion will be open at the end. So we will not do discussion after each talk uh, with uh, one exception. The second, after the second presentation, we will uh, have a short discussion because uh, the speaker will leave. Otherwise, uh, we will have the final discussion at the end. So please ask questions at any time in the chat we will collect them and we will try to address all of them at the end of the, uh, you know, the webinar. So now, without further ado, uh, let me uh, give the floor to uh, Benedict uh, uh, van Neuvenhove, uh, sorry for the pronunciation, <laughs> Managing Director of uh, ECCRT, and he will give a talk on uh, job opportunities in the clinical research organizations world. Well, thank you very much, Professor Sasso, and thank you also to Unica for inviting me for this lecture. I'm very, very excited about this. Uh, let me just share my screen. I hope you can all see it. Um, so thank you again uh, for inviting me and uh, to speak uh, uh, about a topic which is very close to me, uh, um, the CRO world, the clinical research organizations are also sometimes called contract research organizations. They're, these terminologies are used uh, and are mixed. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, what possibilities are out there. And actually by extension, you could also like see this uh, in, the, in the pharma or medical device industry. Similar positions exist in, in those uh, 
uh, organizations. Uh, um, but the CROs, clinical research organizations, are really the companies that are specialized, the specialists in um, clinical development, as they call it. You have my bio, so I will not um, um, speak about this very long. I'm a pharmacist myself, so I started uh, in, in the CRO world for many, many years, and um, I'm not going to further dwell on this. I'm also president of the, the Association of CROs in Belgium, um, and uh, hence illustrating my, my enthusiasm about this area. Um, but maybe just to frame it in the first place, uh, let me talk first about what what clinical research is, because we've talked about several topics in, in previous sessions, and we'll talk more about um, uh, other aspects of the pharma and the biotech industry. So what we are talking about is, uh, as you can see on the slide, the, the clinical trials, uh, um, so the clinical research, uh, which is uh, not the same as drug research and preclinical, it's the research that is being carried out on human beings. Hey, that's what we're talking about. And mo many of you know what it is. Uh, but as you can see on the slide here, it's divided in, in several stages. And it takes quite some time. And not many compounds make it until the end, as you can see on the slide. And of course, nowadays, um, this is a hot topic. Hey, with COVID-19, uh, you hear a lot about the clinical research and the race for the vaccine and, uh, uh, that is happening. And, and timelines are very squeezed. Uh, and, and if we have time, I can come back to that uh, in, in a minute. Uh, but it, it is um, also gaining more popularity uh, the, the, um, or knowledge what, what clinical research is about uh, because of, of, uh, of the need for that vaccine. Uh, and it's, it's getting more um, knowledge and understanding uh, even in, in, uh, in, in, in out there in, in the common world. So I'll, I'll talk about clinical research only, and, and I'll, I'll not talk about um, uh, all the rest in, in, of drug development. Also here, clinical trials, there's very many clinical trials. And you, on, on, the, on the map here, in the, in the, uh, on the world map, you see uh, that, that especially in Europe, there's a lot of clinical trials uh, happening. And actually after the US, uh, Europe is, is, is the most, most common place uh, where trials are being carried out. Um, so it is uh, a quite popular place because of also the expertise that uh, exists uh, on various areas. There's a lot of key uh, opinion leaders in, in, in the market here, but there's also a lot of experts in carrying out clinical research uh, and the regulatory expertise is also here. Yeah. But I will talk about CROs, uh, clinical research organizations. And um, on this slide, you see the top 10 uh, CROs. Uh, these are the bigger ones. Uh, um, uh, but there's, there's very many uh, CROs, uh, the, ranging from those very large ones to like even one or two man companies. And what they do is they, they carry out the clinical research in the name of what they call the sponsor of the clinical research. So the, the, the pharma company or the biotech company that uh, contracts uh, an, an external company to carry out the clinical research independently for, um, and then f in their name. And so they, they, they actually work uh, for the sponsors. And, and actually nowadays this is happening more and more. Uh, th there has been an, an ongoing and an, an year to year increase of the CRO market. And this, this, this graphs illustrate this where you see the overall sales of pharma uh, which is 703 billion, uh, of which the R&D part takes uh, 130 uh, billion. And then the D part in the R&D counts for 100 uh, billion. Uh, and uh, where more or less half of that is really for clinical research activities. And so in, in total, 50 billion more or less. Uh, whereas the current uh, CRO market is estimated as 25 uh, billion, which means there's still room to further increase. And that's also happening nowadays. Eh? There's still a 6% continuous annual growth rate in, in the CRO world. So um, if, uh, if you talk about job opportunities, I think the best place to be is CROs um, because they are growing very fast and they're uh, being hired by pharma companies more and more. And this can be done in several ways. And I'll come back to that uh, later on in the presentation. But let me also, because maybe not all of you are familiar with kind of positions uh, exist uh, in clinical research, in whether or not in CROs, I'll leave in the middle. 
but um, there's very many uh, positions and I will only cover uh, the main ones, you know, um, because there's, there's more than 50 different positions uh, out there. Um, and I'll do this um, using the, the clinical trial life cycle uh, uh, where that you see on the screen now where where it all starts with defining a, a study objectives uh, which you then write down in a protocol and then you carry out the, you get approval for the protocol you carry out the study you recruit your patients and you analyze the data and then hopefully you will be able to prove uh, your your study objective uh, using the study results so that's just the, the whole life cycle and, I'm, and I know that I'm very quick uh, but you'll you'll be able to read uh, a lot about this uh, in the literature uh, what I will do is I'll, I'll just focus on a number of positions and positions that are really uh, um, accepting um, people that just start their career because you will always see there's a lot of positions where there's a lot of experience required and even the starting positions nowadays people are very often uh, or companies are very often requiring experience so I'm going to talk about the oops sorry too quick um, I'm first place the regulatory department uh, within a CRO environment uh, this means the, the department that does the submissions uh, for approval for a study uh, a submission to both the ethics committees and the competent authorities and uh, well in some some CROs also do submissions to for marketing authorization uh, but that's not included in the scope of this presentation because we're talking only about the clinical research part so there, there's also um, regulatory affairs associates that um, are helping out um, those for those submissions. So and, and and that's a position that you could aim for uh, when when starting a career. Uh, what you need is like you you need to have a sense for detail, like uh, to make documents that are needed for the submissions um, to for for approval. So that's the regulatory part. I'll. The majority of my time I'll spend on this uh, this part is the, the, actu the active study where there's uh, patients in the study and um, from a sponsor or CRO perspective the main department involved is called clinical operations uh, and you may have heard about the position uh, clinical research associate uh, or clinical trial administrator or of course project manager um, I'll come back to the CRA clinical research associate position in a minute but that's the bulk of the positions and the, the vast majority is in this area. But you have also site um, uh, departments and just naming a couple of them, uh, the, the, the drug safety or pharmacovigilance uh, is very much also important uh, because you in a clinical study, you, what the aim is that you want to measure the efficacy and the safety of the product. So the, uh, monitoring the safety across the clinical development is very important. So we have positions like pharmacovigilance associate or pharmacovigilance management manager. Uh, and I think that especially for pharmacists, uh, there's uh, like a, um, a, a quite uh, quite good profile uh, to go in this area. I will not cover quality assurance because uh, Iris is going to talk about that uh, after my session. And not to forget another uh, area where there's, uh, there are job opportunities is the clinical side, say the, the, the hospitals and or investigators that carry out the clinical uh, uh, studies. And there are uh, positions like study coordinators where uh, you coordinate a clinical study in a hospital setting. And this is actually a study coordinator is the equivalent to the position that we will talk about later, the CRA, uh, in which is in the industry. So they are each other's counterparts, if you will. Uh, so uh, CRA coordinates the study from the company point of view, whereas the study coordinator does that from the hospital point of view. Um, and then last but not least, once you collected your, your, your data, of course, those data have to be managed. They have to be cleaned and, and make, make, made ready for analysis so that uh, you, you get proper data sets so that you can carry out your statistical analysis. Also there, there are starting positions uh, like data management uh, uh, positions that do accept um, uh, people graduating uh, from university. 
and well, and again, as I mentioned, there's very more uh, positions out there, uh, and, and you see some uh, on on the slide here. And I won't go in detail uh, because there's a lot of uh, of things happening in, in in and a lot of things need to happen in clinical studies. Like for instance, the drug needs to be shipped, or there's ECGs to be taken from the patients, and and and, and in a central laboratory, um, or just blood samples need to be taken and centralized. And there's all specialized companies that actually do this uh, for the sponsors, for the pharma companies, uh, if they don't do it themselves. Uh, um, so, but they're all positions uh, linked um, to clinical research. And as I mentioned, there's more than 50 in the, uh, positions in clinical development. So there is quite a lot. So it's quite exciting uh, to have so many actually. And then moving to the next slide. Yeah. Um, well, again, this slide illustrates how how complex uh, this is. Uh, so uh, this this slide depicts in the center you have the clinical operations with the project manager and 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 the CRAs, and these people deal with a lot of stakeholders, as you can see. And where the, the the green ones are within the CRO, for instance, uh, but there's also the, the other ones. Like the red ones are then the 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 ones in the pharma company or the biotech company. Uh, the, the yellow ones are other uh, companies that other vendors, other uh, specialized niche providers, I like what I mentioned, the central laboratory, for instance, uh, the CRO people have also to interact with those companies. And then last but not least, also the blue one, the, the sites. Uh, so the, this is uh, a main stakeholder in this and not to forget uh, the regulatory authority. So it's, it's quite complex and, and very often um, all the different positions interact with each other in a kind of a matrix structure uh, uh, where the project managers keeps oversight of this. Having said that, and that's also why I mentioned this, this project manager, a lot of people think, oh, I'm going to become a project manager eh, when I graduate. But nowadays, clinical research has become so complex and, and so um, involving so many uh, stakeholders that it's, it's very difficult to, like, to jump in this as a project manager right from the start. So you often need more experience to start with that. But let me come back to the CRA position, Clinic Research Associate position. Um, this is, maybe if I can explain it in my own words, it's, it's, it's the position that is actually the link between the company on the one hand doing the clinical study and the, the sites that carry out the research with the patients. So as a CRA, you are in between those two parties eh, where you want to make sure that the study is carried out according to the rules and the regulations and to GCP, eh, as it's mentioned on the slide, these are the responsibilities as a, mon a monitor that you have. Monitor is a synonym for, for CRA. So you carry out uh, uh, your visits to the sites to make sure that the quality of the data is appropriate and high on the one hand. And most importantly, that the, the subjects are protected at all time, and that the safety is protected, and the at, and, and the, the research is being done in an ethical way. So, as I mentioned, you are in the middle of the two because you are you are you are part of of a, sp a sponsor company or a CRO, and you have to make sure that your study results are there. But on the on the other hand, you also work with the hospitals, which makes it nice because you are involved in uh, in all the aspects actually. And also there, CRAs do uh, exist in junior positions uh, that would allow uh, graduates to um, to join uh, uh, after they, 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 they got their diploma. Having said that, also even there, more and more, if you look at vacancies, uh, very often even there for CRA positions, uh, experience is uh, as a requirement. So um, let me just summarize the part that I have is, is like, a couple of tips for you in finding a job in clinical research. And the first place is, of course, to start with your CV. Make make it interesting, make it appealing. Because if a vacancy is uh, is published by a company, you have to realize that a lot of people apply for those vacancies. So if you're not standing out with your CV, the chances of being selected uh, uh, for like an interview or subsequent phases are going to be reduced. So make it appealing, make it show what you really want eh, and what you, where your ambitions are and what you have achieved so far. Experience, 
if you have any experience, if it's only slightly related, even if like you you were involved in your master thesis with clinical research, mention it uh, so that that at least you can show that you have gained some experience. Second and the third tip is also don't aim too high. As I mentioned, don't go for a project management position uh, if you don't have experience, but like start at the bottom. Uh, I didn't speak about my profile in the very beginning, but I also started after my PhD with this as a CRA position, but I was able to climb the ladder very, very quickly actually because of that, that's, that's the, the profile that I had. So my advice is start lower and then move up quick uh, uh, rather than trying very hard to, to, to like um, enter the company in, at a higher level. And also consider your, your strengths and, and your talents, so because that will be what is needed for the company that is going to hire you. Eh? Um, that's an important element. The size of the organization is important as well. So you have large heroes, uh, small companies, you have some big pharma, you have some small biotech companies. This is also something that you need to take into account. Um, staffing organizations, I mentioned this because that's also a very um, an important uh, fraction of the clinical research is being done actually by pharma or biotech companies hi temporarily hiring staff from staffing companies or CROs that do the project and then eventually go back to the CRO afterwards. So that's also a possibility for you to consider. There's 53 positions, as I mentioned. So don't always focus on, on maybe one per uh, on one position, but try to like start broader uh, to, to gain your uh, chances. And last but not least, focus uh, also go into the social media and network there because that's also very important to make sure that you are visible and and, and get recommendations for instance in linkedin uh, that is very helpful when you look for a position and with that i'd like to wrap it up and give it back to uh, professor sasso for the next speaker perfect thank you very much uh, barry for this very interesting presentation i think the information you gave uh, will be very interesting for the participants I think many CROs, are, to be frank, I mean, based on my experience with the students in pharma and biotech sector, they are not very well known. Uh, the list that you that you send, maybe probably they know more the big pharma, but uh, not so much the uh, CROs. So I think it's very useful for for the young people to look really at these uh, companies because they can offer a, a lot of opportunities in different sectors, as you said. So thank you very much. Uh, really uh, very useful. So now it is a pleasure to give the floor to Iris Corte de Fries. Director of Quality Assurance at SGS Life Sciences in Belgium, and she will give a talk on uh, job opportunities in clinical research quality management. Thank you, Luciano. Uh, yes, quality, quality management. So uh, Benedict already mentioned that there are jobs there. Um, and there were a few on his slides, but what I would like to do here now is go a bit deeper into quality management and what it really is about, because I'm not sure that uh, for everybody this is, uh, this is an obvious um, uh, field. So I have a long experience in quality management in clinical research. Cur currently, I'm the director of quality assurance in a CRO, SGS Life Sciences, which has its headquarters um, in Belgium. So what is quality? When we talk about quality, in fact, we mean, of course, good quality, not bad quality. But how do we define good? So uh, good quality, one of the definitions is good quality is the absence of errors that matter. And the level of quality that you want to obtain has to be defined upfront with its quality tolerance limits. So wh why am I saying this? Quality doesn't mean 100% uh, correct all, at all points uh, at all times because that is uh, not possible, that never happens, uh, and uh, it's extremely expensive. Um, so the good quality defined upfront is a requirement for everything that we do in the clinical operations. So it has to be um, embedded in our processes. Our staff must be selected accordingly. Our staff must be trained accordingly. 
There must be oversight of all the activities and quality control steps need to be built into our processes at the appropriate uh, moments. Hold on. Yeah, does it? Yeah, but that work. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. Can you still see my screen, Luciano? Yes, yes, yes. That's okay, yes. Do it's I have to change anything? It's a little bit smaller, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, it's not yeah, in display in display settings you can you can change it via again. Yeah. Um, that was in, the, in display settings. Yeah. Okay. This is better. Yeah. Um, so at um, I have a picture here. I have a picture here of um, the cost of quality versus the level of quality. In the um, vertical axis, you see the cost. In the horizontal axis, the level of quality. So if we start um, with uh, the um, upgoing line from left to right, you see that, uh, of course, uh, very low quality, 100% defect doesn't cost anything. And when you move to the right and you expect higher quality, the cost um, uh, goes up exponentially. Um, on the uh, other hand, low, uh, very low quality, so many defects is very costly for the organization because all these defects have to be corrected. So you can see that there is an optimum that you need to find as an organization of the level of quality versus the, um, the cost that you can spend on this. Okay, the next slide is the, um, the specifically on the quality in clinical research. So quality in clinical research has two pillars and Benedict already mentioned them, subject safety, and data credibility. What does this mean? Subject, the subject is the healthy volunteer or the patient volunteer who uh, is the subject of the, uh, of the investigation. The safety, the rights and the well-being of each individual uh, participant in the trial uh, need to be protected. Then data are of course the clinical trial data and um, we must be able to trust them in order to make sound decisions for market approval for medicinal products and uh, to keep the products on the market. So it's very important that uh, we can trust what comes out of the uh, uh, investigation. Um, yeah, then how to manage quality more and more um, in clinical research, there is emphasis on the fact that we must work on a risk-based, with a risk-based method. You cannot manage everything at a very high level. You need to know where to put your focus, uh, where to put your budgets. So the first step in the quality risk-based quality management cycle is to identify which processes and which data are critical for us. And you focus on that. Doesn't mean that you have to ignore everything else. That's not true. But your main interest is uh, those that are critical. Of those processes and data, you need to identify the risks that they run, whatever risks they run uh, during your trial. These risks need to be evaluated. So that's the risk evaluation. How do we do this? We, we have to assess their seriousness by looking at the likelihood that they will occur, looking at the detectability. If something is going wrong, um, can we see that it's going wrong or will we always be too late? So uh, low detectability um, increases the seriousness of the risk and then the impact what happens whenever the thing that you're looking at really happens and together they are the seriousness then when you know that for each risk you need to take a decision what am i going to do with it 
You may decide, I accept this risk. It's not so big, I can handle this. You can say this is so bad, I'm going to avoid it. I'm just not going to do this. You may decide to transfer the risk that is, for example, take an insurance. So the insurance company will carry the, the damage uh, in case uh, something goes wrong. And you can, and that's in fact uh, something that is very uh, often applicable, you can modify the risk, uh, making sure that it's uh, after the, uh, the, the modification, the mitigation as it's called is done, that the risk is uh, acceptable. Throughout this cycle, it's very important to communicate the risks and the risk mitigation with all the stakeholders of the trial that you are involved in or that section of the trial. Uh, then comes the risk review. Um, you can't, uh, it's not a one, one moment thing. You have to um, uh, review every now and then your risks and your risk success evalu evaluation and the uh, control measures. Uh, at the end, the risk and whatever you did with it, your mitigation needs to be reported so the regulators can see um, how you dealt with this. And then you're back at the top and uh, as you can see, this is a cyclic movement. Um, yeah, then this quality control in clinical research, uh, this qu quality management in clinical research, how is it actually done? In practice, uh, the requirements for quality in clinical research have been trans translated into guidelines and into uh, regulatory requirements. And I mention here, well, the, uh, the most relevant overview. So, first of all, in clinical research, we have the ICH, the International Council on Harmonization of Technical Requirements for Pharmaceuticals for Human Use. Um, this is um, a council consisting of internationally of regulator authorities and pharmaceutical industry. Um, the ICH has many guidelines and in clinical research, the most, uh, most uh, outstanding is the good clinical practice, but we also have to uh, abide with the uh, good pharmacology, um, pharmacovigilance practice, um, manufacturing, laboratory, distribution, just to mention a few, there are more of course. These guidelines have been translated into international and national laws and compliance is a prerequisite for market approval and indeed for keeping um, your medication on the market. So that's in practice how, uh, how the uh, quality requirements uh, are translated. These guidelines, of course, um, well, they discuss a lot more than purely quality. They discuss how to go about your processes in order to get to the high quality. Um, in my um, short introduction that I sent to Luciano a while ago, I mentioned also I would talk about the challenge of data integrity. Uh, why is that? Because data integrity uh, is being challenged to a very large extent nowadays. There has been an enormous increase in technological capabilities over, say, the last 25 years. It has been exponential uh, with the advent of uh, computerized systems and electronic records. Uh, this brings risks, uh, increased risks for the integrity of the data. Uh, loss of context, what does it mean? At, uh, in the picture, you see an eight. Um, if you register something in an electronic uh, data capture system and you say eight, and later on you have to read it or somebody else has to read it, they say eight what? Eight, eight degrees centigrade, um, eight kilogram, eight o'clock in the morning, eight o'clock in the evening, eight centimeter, meter, whatever. So uh, the context is uh, crucial. Um, there can be unnoticed and hidden changes to data, 
possibly by access uh, to system by unauthorized persons. So a thief who comes in and who changes things. And in particular, if this change is not recorded in the system, you have a big problem because you will not know. Uh, there can be loss of data when there are transitions from one uh, computer system into the other, for example. And uh, data can be uh, not retrievable uh, because, for example, hardware and software has changed with which, uh, in fact, uh, is already happening. Who can read a floppy disk? Well, in many systems, uh, many people don't have the system to do that or systems haven't been kept uh, live to be able to do this. So that's the challenge of data integrity, which is very much inherent in uh, quality management. So now I come to the roles in quality management, which uh, can be found in, in the pharma um, uh, industry, in the CROs, at the investigator sites and in institutions. I've just listed um, not official um, job titles because they can be very uh, different between companies. So there is work uh, in the uh, regulatory affairs, interaction with regulators. There is the uh, quality and compliance role uh, that gives advice to the business, reviews procedures to make sure that the business works um, well in compliance with the regulations. There is the operational quality controller that's a role within the operations to uh, check at certain points on a very regular basis. Then there um, are the authors of the standard operating procedures that are required. Um, management of deviations. Many deviations uh, happen in practice and for these deviations a root cause analysis needs to be performed and a corrective action and preventive action plan needs to be designed and executed. Computerized system validation. As I mentioned on the previous slide, computerized systems are very, um, very important and they need to be validated. Information security management has to do with, well, stealing of information, losing information. Then there is the role of auditor, quality assurance, uh, within quality assurance. This is an independent activity, uh, independent of operational activities and has a sampled approach. Not everything is checked, just a sample. Um, there are jobs in the government, assessment of submissions for market approval. There are jobs in other institutions to assess, for example, requests for funding. Uh, banks also uh, look for people to do this. Um, your background. Uh, well, everything goes, in fact, in medical sciences, uh, medicine, et cetera, et cetera. But I've also, I also mentioned nursing, laboratory techniques, and computer science. A PhD is not required, um, but language abilities are very important. And I would like to add here, in fact, also um, computer, well, savviness. So you need to be able to work at least on a computer. Understanding of clinical research is important, but it can be learned on the job. Um, what is very re uh, um, uh, relevant is that you need to be quality minded. You really need to understand how quality management works and that it is important. The big challenge is the balance to balance the requirements from a quality and regulatory point of view with the requirements of the operational teams. The operational teams have to deal with complex situations, short timelines, tight budgets. And that means that for them, the quality and compliance requirements can be experienced as a big hindrance. So you need to, well, to uh, cope with that, manage that in, uh, in a constructive way. Thank you for your attention. I would like to mention that um, I'm happy to take some questions now. Uh, unfortunately, I have to leave the webinar after this uh, because of uh, pressing uh, matters in my company. Thank you. Thank you very much, Iris, for this very interesting presentation. I 
uh, while we wait for some uh, um, questions in uh, in the uh, chat, we mentioned that this is another sector I think not very well known among uh, young people, among students. So again, it was very useful also to explain what does it mean, you know, quality management uh, in a company, etc. And also your observation about uh, the job titles. I mean, there are different job titles. And I think this also can be confusing for uh, I think young people that you know sometimes they, they confuse the different positions and they don't know exactly how to apply. And I know that you have a PhD, like also uh, Benedict. Uh, he did not mention anything, but I, I know that. So my general question for you, which is your advice for a young person, for a student in, in pharmacy or biotechnology interested in this field? Uh, uh, what uh, kind of a path uh, do you think would be the best? Uh, would a PhD uh, be uh, the best choice or there are some other postgraduate specializations, masters that you would recommend or uh, would it be better to try to enter uh, immediately in a company, maybe with a stage or something and then you know, try to climb uh, the ladder as uh, Benedict said before. So which is your general advice for a young person interested in this field? Yeah. Um... Uh, to disappoint some people, a PhD is not necessary. Of course, a PhD can be to your advantage because it shows a certain mentality and, and mental capabilities, so to speak, but it's not really necessary. Uh, my advice would be to start in uh, some uh, practical field uh, in the clinical research business, for example, uh, as a CRA of uh, as a data manager. So you start you need to understand the business that you're going to work in and then you can develop an interest into quality and quality management um, this is not uh, cast in stone of course uh, it is the path that i have followed uh, and it has served me well so i've been a cra cra manager project manager uh, etc and then i've taken on more and more uh, quality management tasks. Uh, and especially for the big challenge to work with operational people who are always under pressure and tight budgets, you must be able to understand um, what they, their point of view, uh, to be able to, uh, to uh, support them. On the other hand, there is also room in uh, quality management for people who are not so eager to interact a lot with uh, with other uh, colleagues and who prefer to be well more uh, working on things at their desk. There's also room for them. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, well, for example, in the uh, in the computer system uh, arena, there is a lot of oppor opportunity, but also I think everywhere in in uh, uh, quality management, there's room for different personalities. Uh, but my advice is, it's best to understand clinical research to some point from experience to be able to assess the relevance of uh, the quality requ requirements in a proper way. Thank I you very much, very, very useful. So maybe we have time for a very short uh, question and short, very short answer. I don't know, Sibel, if Joss, if you have any uh, anything to well, ask. I have one, but uh, Sibel can ask uh, something if she wants. Uh, well, please go ahead. No, I would just like to ask uh, Iris, thank you for your presentation. Could you briefly describe the difference between a quality controller, an auditor, and an inspector, please? Ah, okay. A quality controller is somebody who works in the operational team and is responsible to do systematic uh, checks, quality checks, at some points in the process that have been defined that it's absolutely necessary to check again that everything uh, uh, was done correctly or happened correctly. So quality control is an operational role. Um, an auditor is independent. An auditor uh, defines, um, well, what needs to be audited. This is usually uh, um, on request of a senior management or in the case of CRO, it is an auditor comes from the client. Uh, they take 
they, dis they take a certain field, for example, one trial or one system, uh, they define their scope, they take a sample, and they check that as well as, well as they uh, can do. So that's absolutely not quality control. There is always a disclaimer in a report from an auditor that um, they, well, that they only checked some, se some section and they con make conclusions based on that sample. An inspector uh, is part of the government uh, EMA, for example, or in Belgium, the Belgian uh, uh, government. And in fact, what they do is the same as an auditor, but they are an inspector. So what they find is, uh, well, can have a much bigger impact uh, on the company or on the investigational sites. In practice, um, investigational sites are inspected um, more often than companies but uh, companies are also inspected. Uh, if the inspector um, doesn't, uh, isn't happy with what they find, they check against uh, GCP, against uh, regulations, and also against the company's own SOP, SOPs. Sorry. Uh, if they are not happy, then the company or the site can have a big problem. In the end, uh, the um, market authorization of the product in question can be halted. Thank you very much, Iris. Uh, this was very interesting. Unfortunately, it's a bit uh, late now, so I would like to leave the floor now to Professor Thomas to introduce the next two speakers. And I really, I kindly ask to everyone uh, to keep the time because uh, we really want to have a, a general discussion at the end. So let's leave some time at the end for discussion. Please, uh, Joss, over to you. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Our next speaker will be uh, Vicky van der Nieuwenhuizen. Um, she qualified as a pharmacist and later on as a hospital pharmacist at Leuven University, but entered the pharmaceutical industry quite uh, quickly uh, as a product uh, manager and later on became director of marketing and marketing and, and the regular, no, medical affairs, sorry. She's going to talk about job opportunities and career opportunities in medical affairs and marketing. Uh, please, Vicky, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, good morning to everybody. I'm going to share my screen. And hopefully you can see, do you see the, the, the full screen or do you see the presenter mode? It's okay. The presenter yeah. mode, yes, you presenter mode, yeah, but it's yeah. okay. Ah, but I can swipe it, no problem, like that. Yeah. Okay, it's better. Right. better. Okay. So, good morning to everybody, and thank you for um, having me invited for this webinar. I'm glad to share my experience with uh, with other people. Um, well, until now, you have seen a lot of job opportunities in the previous presentation in discovery, research, non clinical, and clinical development, but once you have for your drug a good scientific file, file sorry, you can uh, start with all the administrative procedures uh, for marketing authorization, price and reimbursement, and so on. But uh, personally, I would like to focus today on the commercialization phase, which you can do at global level or at a local level. Why is that phase, that commercialization phase, so important? Well, it's important because the development of a drug is very expensive. Um, on average, um, it costs more than 1.25 billion euro. Uh, moreover, when you start with a lot of drug candidates, you never know which one uh, will end and will be put on the market. A lot of drug candidates just don't um, get to the finish line. And once you are put on the market with your drug, you never know um, how big will be your success or how long will be the success uh, in sales of your uh, drug. So it's quite important that um, when you have put your drug on the market, you try to have a big turnover. And this is important, why? Because the turnover that you are going to generate here will be reinvest in the research and development to discover some new drugs. And that's a, a very, um, that's of really big importance for the pharmaceutical industry, of course. 
many departments are involved in the commercialization phase, um, especially medical affairs, marketing, training, and sales. What I would like to focus on is medical affairs and marketing department today. These are two um, central departments in this commercialization phase. Uh, they are the central contact points for the global subsidiary and headquarter. Uh, they are really the central contact point for a drug and they are communicating about the drug to uh, market access, regulatory affairs, R&D, but of course also training and sales. For marketing and medical affairs, sales is a very important uh, department and they are often communicating uh, with them. Now, the difference between medical affairs and marketing is that they have a different approach uh, in this matter. Medical affairs will focus on more the medical insights of the drug, while marketing will more focus on the business aspects, on the market aspects of the drug. When you look at the commercialization process, you see that you have different steps. First, you need to well understand your market and analyze it. And on the basis of, them, of that, you can define an objective, your strategy, your target, your message, and then you can deploy a complete action plan. Now let's look together how medical affairs and marketing tackle these different steps. When we think about analysis, you can make some qualitative research to understand the market, to understand what kind of patient profiles you have, uh, which HCP will be interested in your treatment, what are the needs of patients, what are the needs of uh, your HCPs, your healthcare professionals. That's the reason why you are doing some qualitative research. But then you also need to measure that market and to measure all the different parameters that you have investigated. And that's the objective of your quantitative research. Now, Medical affairs and marketing department are going to use different sources of information to do all those analyses. And medical affairs, they will use more scientific um, sources of information. They will focus on uh, all the scientific literature and they will really go into depth to understand um, all the properties of the drug, of the market and so on, of the patients and so on. They are going to visit a lot of congresses and they are going uh, to visit um, experts, specialists, GPs, patients through face-to-face -face visits, through advisory boards and so on. Marketing will more focus on some quantitative aspects of the market. They are going to analyze uh, how big are the patient reservoirs, uh, what are the competitors doing in terms of sales, in terms of promotional investments and so on. But be aware that it's not because they are busy with those more business aspects that they are not aware of all the scientific information. In order to do all those business uh, researches, they need to have a very good understanding of the scientific uh, aspects of the drugs and of the patients. So they are also going to read that scientific literature, uh, going to congresses and going to visit uh, some experts. It's not that you have a really uh, big uh, line between medical affairs and marketing. There is a big overlap between both. They are working together, but they have each their own uh, approach. Once they have done all those analyses, medical affairs department and marketing department are going to define together the objective and the strategy of the drug. The objective needs always to be smart, like we say specific objective, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time limited. For the strategy, medical affairs and marketing are going to look together at the patient targeting, the HCP targeting, and the message. What do we mean by that? Well, for the patient targeting, they have to think about which patient profile will benefit the most of the developed drug. What will be the biggest patient reservoir, for example? For the HCP targeting, medical affairs and marketing will discuss together which HCP do we need to visit? Because it's not probably not necessary to visit every doctor, every GP or every pharmacist with your drug. Some will be more interested in your drug than others. That's also a strategic important aspect that you need to decide. And finally, what will be the main message that you are going to say about your drug? 
What is your added value and your unique selling point from your drug? What is the reason why a doctor will prescribe your drug instead of another competitor? When you have decided of those strategic imperatives, you need to develop um, and to deploy an action plan. And you need to, to select a set of communication channels and to decide of the right content for the right segments at the right time. And we have many, many, many communication channels this time. We have more than 50 channels that you can use in for your communication. And we made the distinguish between online and offline media on one hand and between paid media, owned media and earned media. Let's have a look. Marketing department will mostly use paid media and own promotional media. For example, for a paid media, media you are going to uh, pay, for example, for a sponsorship um, to be present with your conference booth at the Congress. As a product manager working in the marketing department, you are going to make this conference booth and you are going to be in contact with the Congress organization to put this down. But you can also develop a press ad, pay for, be, for uh, the sending uh, the emailings uh, and so on. But as product manager working in the marketing department, you also have uh, the possibility to use some own promotional media. And the most important there is probably the medical call. As a product manager, you are going to prepare all the communication material for the medical reps. You are going to develop to develop, for example, the e-visual aid, which the medical reps are using during their medical call. You can also develop for them the um, leaflets, for example, for patients or um, documents about your drug, but you often make also recommendations for patients. You can develop websites or applications for patients in order that they can better um, treat themselves. But that's because that is your final objective. It, it is that patients will be better treated with your drugs. <clears throat> the medical affairs department, they will use other kind of media. They will use more what we call owned media with medical service. For example, they are going to organize some congresses, satellite symposia during congresses at maybe international level or national level. They are also responsible for all the medical information about the drug. When HCPs have questions about their drug, they are responsible for giving the answer and they contribute to medical education. When they see that there are sometimes data gaps and a lack of information, they are able to organize a phase four studies to generate new data. And finally, um, at medical affairs, you have you are often in contact with a lot of experts. Now, in order to be complete, you can see that marketing and medical affairs are using different channels, but um, you have one third type of media, and that's what we call the earned media. And there, in fact, your communication channel are your um, customers. Uh, in our case, in the pharma industry, it means that uh, it are patients or other doctors or pharmacists that will speak about your product. It's a medium that you earned. You, you don't pay for it. It's not yours. You don't have control on it. But if you are present in that kind of media, it is or it has the, uh, the biggest credibility. Now, don't forget, and that's a very important aspect in the pharma industry and in pharmaceutical marketing, which is different from other kind of industry is that with the pharmaceutical uh, marketing or in medical affairs, all your communication has to be compliant with different regulations, rules, and so on. Most of the subsidiaries uh, have even a specific function in the subsidiary who is responsible to check that everything what we communicate is compliant with all those uh, rules. Now, um, as you can see, the, the job of a marketeer, of a product manager, or uh, of a medical affairs manager can be really very different from day to day. Um, you can grow also in those type of departments. Um, and everything is, in fact, possible uh, when you start at marketing level or medical affairs level. You can grow within your department. 
most of the time you start with a junior profile, for example, junior product manager, or at medical affairs, you can start as medical science liaison or medical advisor. And then afterwards you can grow at senior level or you can become a manager or director and leading your own team. You can have a job at a national level or international level, or starting at marketing or medical affairs, you can discover another department. You see often exchanges between medical affairs and marketing because those are two departments who are working closely with each other. So they know each other very well and you can switch from one department to the other. But you can also go to other departments because as I said before, marketing and medical affairs have really central points in the communication phase of the, of the drug. So you are in close contact with different kinds of departments and you have from every department, you have a little bit of experience and with sometimes additional training, you can start from medical affairs, you can go to R&D, or you can go from marketing to the sales department and or to market access, for example. Now, what are we looking for during job interviews, for example, when I'm looking for a good medical affairs uh, manager or a good product manager? Well, of course, a good scientific background is paramount, uh, but you need to be patient oriented. Um, and this aspect, you need to combine that with uh, a business mind. You need to be able to understand the company business goals. At, for a marketing function, it can be interesting to have a second diploma like an MBA, marketing management, or something like that. It's interesting, but it's certainly not a must. Um, you also need to be analytic and critical and be able to Think critical. Why? Because you have to make a lot of analyzes, analyzes in terms of business analyzes, but also um, analyzes uh, from the studies to interpret them, to define the benefits of a drug as well as the uh, limitations of a drug. You need to have excellent communication skills because you need to be able to deal with a variety of stakeholders, specialists, GPs, patients. You need to be able to adapt your communication in terms of which you have in front of you. You need to be good in oral presentations, face-to-face, -face, uh, but also presentations to, to, to a public, and written, like for example, sometimes at medical affairs, you contribute to the um, writing of publications and so on. In a marketing level, a sales experience, sometimes it's a small experience from six months or, or a year um, as a rep, for example, it can be interesting. It's not a must, but it's interesting because when, it's, it's um, the function, for, you are going to develop at marketing level, you are going to develop the strategy and the um, documents for them. So it's interesting to have their experience. And if you have some digital skills, that can also always be interesting just to make yourself different from other um, candidates for this kind of job. Last but not least, Think about what you are looking for. Think about the function, if it suits your expectations. Think about the company size. Do you want a big multinational or something small? Think, try to have information about the corporate culture. Think about training possibilities. Training in the beginning of your career is very important. For example, Sergey, we invest in training in the beginning of your career uh, because we have a a lot of scientific knowledge, but we have not that much knowledge about business aspects. So it's interesting to receive that in the beginning of your careers. Think also, of course, about the terms and conditions of your employment and about the location. Do you want to start at national level or maybe you want to start with a, a stage at um, international uh, level in an international subsidiary? It can be interesting uh, in the beginning of your career. So. I'm getting at the end of my talk. Uh, I wish you all good luck in, uh, the f in your future career, uh, because I think in the pharma industry, you can do so many things that uh, I'm sure that you can find something that suits you. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you, Vicky, for your very comprehensive uh, presentation. And uh, I'm sure you will be happy to uh, answer questions uh, whenever they pop up in the chat. Absolutely. We move on now to the next.